Hi, so today I want to talk about this book, Approaches and Methods in Language Teaching, A Description and Analysis by Jack C. Richards and Theodore S. Rogers. We're going to look at the first chapter, which is on a brief history of language teaching. So it covers Latin language teaching, the grammar translation method, language teaching innovations in the 19th century, that's the 1800s, the reform movement, and the direct method. So about 500 years ago, Latin was the world's most widely studied foreign language. It was the dominant language of education, commerce, religion, and government in the Western world. Then French, Italian, and English replaced Latin due to political changes. <clears throat> and in England, in the 1500s to the 1700s, children went to grammar schools where they studied Latin through memorization. <clears throat> and as modern languages began to enter the curriculum of European schools in the 18th century, the 1700s, they were taught using the same basic procedures that were used for teaching Latin. This meant there was lots of grammar, memorization, and translation, and no real communication. Then we have the grammar translation method, which was popular from the 1840s to the 1940s, and is still used today to some extent. Its principles include, one, using grammar translation to read literature as a mental discipline, for intellectual development, and for rule memorization. Two, mainly reading and writing with little to no speaking or listening. Three, learning vocabulary from texts, bilingual word lists, dictionaries, memorization, deductive approach, grammar, and translation. And the deductive approach means you are given rules and you use them to study and use the language. And four, the focus was on the sentence and translating into the target language and back. And the target language is the language that you're learning, the foreign language that you're studying. And five, accuracy was a priority. And six, grammar is taught deductively and in an organized and systematic way. And seven, the student's native language is the medium of instruction is used to explain new items and to enable comparisons to be made between the target language and the L1. And the L1 is the student's first language. Language teaching innovations in the 19th century or the 1800s. In the mid 1800s, people started questioning um, and rejecting the grammar translation method. More communication among Europeans created a demand for oral proficiency in foreign languages. And some of the reformers were Marcel, Prendergast, and Gawain. And Gawain promoted the use of context, gestures, and actions in language teaching. These techniques later became part of situational language teaching and total physical response, TPR. And there was an interest in how children learn languages. Then we have the reform movement. In 1886, the International Phonetic Association um, was created, and that association created the International Phonetic Alphabet, the IPA, which is still used today. And the International Phonetic Association advocated, one, the study of the spoken language, two, phonetic training in order to establish good pronunciation habits, three, the use of conversation texts and dialogues to introduce conversational phrases and idioms, four, an inductive approach to the teaching of grammar. So that's the opposite of the deductive approach. That means you look at the use of the language and from that study and practice, you analyze <clears throat> the language and come up with grammar rules. And five, teaching new meanings through establishing associations within the target language rather than by establishing associations with the mother tongue. And then we have Henry Sweet, The Practical Study of Languages, 1899. His principles included, one, careful selection of what is to be taught, two, imposing limits on what is to be taught, 
three, arranging what is to be taught in terms of listening, speaking, reading, and writing, and four, grading of materials from simple to complex. And other reformers include Vieter, Sweet, and others, um, and they believed, one, the spoken language is primary, two, phonetics should be applied to teaching and to teacher training, three, learners should hear the language first before seeing it in written form, four, words should be presented in sentences and sentences should be practiced in meaningful contexts, five, grammar should be taught inductively, six, translation should be avoided. And then we have the direct method. <clears throat> These natural language learning principles were, one, classroom instruction was conducted exclusively in the target language. Two, only everyday vocabulary and sentences were taught. Three, oral communication skills were built up in a carefully graded progression organized around question and answer exchanges, question and answer exchanges between teachers and students in small intensive classes. Four, grammar was taught inductively. Five, new teaching points were introduced orally. Six, concrete vocabulary was taught through demonstrations, objects, and pictures. Abstract vocabulary was taught by association of ideas. Seven, both speech and listening comprehension were taught. And eight, correct pronunciation and grammar were emphasized. And then we have the Berlitz method, which is similar to the direct method, though Maximilian Berlitz never called it that. Its principles, which are still used today, are as follows. One, never translate, demonstrate. Two, never explain, act. Three, never make a speech, ask questions. Four, never imitate mistakes, correct. Five, never speak with single words, use sentences. Six, never speak too much, make students speak a lot. Seven, never use the book, use your lesson plan. Eight, never jump around, follow your plan. Nine, never go too fast, keep the pace of the student. 10, never speak too slowly, speak normally. 11, never speak too quickly, speak naturally. 12, never speak too loudly, too loudly, speak naturally. 13, never be impatient, take it easy. Okay, and then questions that prompted innovations <clears throat> and new directions in language teaching in the past. One, what should the goals of language teaching be? Should a language course try to teach conversational proficiency, reading, translation, or some other skill? Two, what is the basic nature of language and how will this affect teaching method? Three, what are the principles for the selection of language content in language teaching? Four, what principles of organization, sequencing, and presentation best facilitate learning? Five, what should the role of the native language be? Six, what processes do learners use in mastering a language, and can these be incorporated into a method? Seven, what techniques, what teaching techniques and activities work best and under what circumstances? Okay, I hope you found that to be interesting and helpful. Um, so I've got some questions for you. You can leave your comments and questions below about this presentation and your thoughts in general about teaching <clears throat> approaches and methods for language um, learning. So how have these methods and approaches affected language teaching and learning throughout history and how do they still uh, affect us today? which ones are still used today and how do you feel about that and which methods and approaches do you prefer thanks for watching have a good day